My name is Aaron Vanek, and I'm here to talk to you about educational live action role playing, or Edu LARPs for short. See, everyone's paying attention, which means you already got a handout and read it. Cool. Okay. Um, live action role playing. All right. What is Edu LARP? Edu LARP uh, is a short term that I use to uh, refers to educational live action role playing. The long definition of EduLARP is an educational LARP is a pedagogical activity where students take on character roles using improvisational acting and pre-written scenarios designed to facilitate self-motivated learning as well as teach predetermined knowledge in a contextual framework. Most educational LARPs are cross-disciplinary. LARPs exercise mental faculties through puzzles and open-ended challenges, physical exercise through movement activities, many with tactile components, and most notably emotional exercise through the because through the alibi of character role that is not quite you, emotions and social practices can be worked out in a safe, controlled environment. I'm sure you saw all that. Actually, you want the short definition. Edu LARPs use make believe, play pretend to teach stuff. That's it. Play pretend to teach stuff. Um, OK. Uh, most LARPs, uh, if you heard of them, are used for entertainment purposes like this. You get to do Lord of the Rings in the forest. Um, they can lead to learning. They often do lead to learning, but that's not their primary purpose. Educational LARPs are primarily designed for education. Their primary goal is to impart specific knowledge uh, uh, to the audience, to the students. Having fun is secondary. It's extremely important, but it's actually secondary, and I want to differentiate between these two. So a lot of LARPs that you hear, you're doing it for fun, and learning is kind of secondary. With an educational LARP, you're actually trying to do that um, that's their primary goal. So it goes to um, edu LARPing is a new term, but it's not actually a new concept. Uh, it just goes by different names. So if you ever heard these things, these are, to me, very similar to LARPs. Experiential learning, process drama, gamified drama, situated learning, and problem-based learning, group-based learning. Experiential learning is the main one. Um, some common educational role-playing activities include mock trials, the model UN club, war games, and uh, disaster preparedness simulations. Um, this here is a, a military situational exercise at Fort Irwin in California, um, where the uh, before uh, soldiers were deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan, they went through uh, simulation training. EduLARP pedagogy can be used for any type of education at any level, but I'm going to kind of focus this on K-12 classroom educate instruction. So here's an example of one. Um, Ancient Mesopotamia uh, was an educational LARP. It was designed uh, by myself and Christian Brown in collaboration with Game Desk. Uh, this was a week-long educational LARP for sixth grade class, 36 students at a private school located in Santa Monica, California. The class normally had two teachers who each worked with half of the students, so 18 and 18 uh, students. Over the course of a day, they would have one class period with one teacher, two or three all together, and then one with either their PE or language teacher. So without changing that schedule, we created an EduLARP where students took on one of four roles. They were either merchants, governors, astrologers, or priests. Uh, they each had four roles, and each role had uh, a specific purpose. So. Um, they would, the, the role, each role would run a, uh, an activity and then they'd all kind of get together uh, for a different one. So the merchants here, uh, we did a market bazaar uh, simulation that required transactions to be recorded on clay in uh, cuneiform numbers. So we used the actual cuneiform numbers. We gave them clay and little pencils to use. Uh, and what we did is for the commodities, the fish, the grain, everything that was training, the merchants had to come up with their own language. The students were designing their own symbolic, symbolic language to represent things for the commodities. Uh, the governors heard uh, cases in a mock trial format, and they had to use the Code of Hammurabi to make judgments. They're using the actual Code of Hammurabi from the Mesopotamia to uh, make judgments. The astrologers here uh, were predicting the futures of other characters using a star wheel based on the Babylonian constellations and the base 60 system. So from ancient Sumerian Babylon is where we got 60 minutes to an hour, 60 seconds to a minute, et cetera, et cetera. So we made a star wheel for them to, uh, to use. Uh, the priests did a dramatic retelling of the Epic of Gilgamesh uh, with a call and response. So you can see the priests, and they had little costumes. You can sort of see we made little costumes for them. So uh, the priests had the orange tabards, the governors had the 
the, uh, I'm gonna mispronounce it, Capia, Capia. Sorry, I'm mispronouncing that. So each of the four roles kind of ran an activity and then we did uh, what's called a fishbowl uh, where the students would get together and they could trade commodities, they could discuss prophecies, build armies, craft trade deals, make temple offerings. These were basically an open-ended, free form period where students just had to stay in character and each character had a number of goals related to two axes of loyalties. So they were loyal to their city state, which were Sipar and um, uh, Sipar and uh, Dilbat, Kish and Borsipa. Plus they had loyalty to their role as a priest or merchant or whatever. Uh, we gave them character sheets. Um, this was designed for a private school. Uh, they were using their own academic standard, standards and we ran this just before Common Core was implemented but we made sure to integrate multiple subjects into the same story theme. Uh, history, science, language, writing, in addition to the softer skills of art, drama, social emotional learning, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, aligning educational arts to academic standards uh, is entirely possible. I've done a, a semester's worth of science edu LARPs using California's eighth grade science standards. Um, so what we found when we ran this ancient Mesopotamia uh, I thought was a success, uh, I believe so. We mainly had extremely high levels of intrinsic motivation, which I think you game designers know you're getting intrinsic motivation. Uh, in here, one of the students, one of the priests, uh, he lobbied the teachers. Uh, they play the judges of Babylon, so those are the two teachers. They were in costume, which was like a bathrobe. Um, they lobbied, he, he came up to them uh, and he lobbied, he said that the priests in this time period were, had far more power and responsibility than what his character role was given. So he made an impromptu five minute oral argument based on research he did the previous night, completely unassigned. He went and did this research himself. And he said the priest should get more income. So we gave him income each day of this week, they got two grain or two fish or something, they got an income. So he, he said that uh, they had responsibility. I want more money, I want more income. So the teachers, the judges agreed and they said, okay, the priests all get an extra share of shekels uh, for the day and each day. So done and done, here he is, very happy that he got more income. So he immediately did this uh, right away. Um, we also noticed emergent gameplay, which is great. If you're game designers, emergent gameplay is just the most awesome thing in the world. So what happened during the market bazaar, when the, when the merchants were doing their activity, which was, a, a, again, a market bazaar, one of the students tried to steal some of the commodities, some of the little cards that he got. Uh, they're just slips of printed paper. And another student saw him, and he goes, stop, thief. And he told the judges, the teachers, that he was trying to steal something. And so the judges said, well, what, what do we do with him? I said, well, it's obvious. You put him on trial tomorrow at the governor's uh, mod. So um, in addition, for the governor's mod, we had a number of cases that uh, my partner Christian designed, but then we also had an action from the previous day. So this, uh, there he is up there. Um, he was the thief and he had to defend himself the next day. So we said, we're gonna put you on trial. So the students were actually able to see an action and the consequence on the next day. So what happened when the thief was sentenced to be cast in the river Euphrates, which is part of the Code of Hammurabi. And if he survived, he would be deemed innocent. And this was represented by asking the student to um, uh, hold his breath for 10 seconds while the teacher shook the, uh, shook the chair and he survived. <laughs> so um, Malik Hiltoff is one of the founders of Usterskov Efterskol, which is a Danish boarding school at the high school level, whose entire curriculum all classes uh, is LARP and game-based. Uh, and he wrote a wonderful essay called Four Reasons Why Edu LARP Works, based on four years of observation at the school, which is now in its 10th year. And he says, uh, one, of the, one of the main reasons is distraction. Edu LARP works because it manages to distract the student from the daily life, giving a greater chance to concentrate on the subject at hand. So I wanna add that LARPs are oftentimes very high energy, interactive experience with a lot of moving parts. It gets very chaotic. And um, uh, Malik noticed that their school special needs students, uh, ADD, ADHD, had the highest college acceptance rate compared to all other Danish schools. Uh, motivation, um, in the case of the would-be thief in Memphis of Atame, it was pretty obvious he was motivated to uh, um, learn the code of Hammurabi. He was studying, he prepared his defense so his character wouldn't die. 
Um, the motivation, place students in situations where motivation for doing their schoolwork is very clear. Activity, um, EduLARP works because it activates students in a school setting and usually high level. Traditional learning often creates a bottleneck. My thing just went down. Is this this? Uh, okay. Uh, the screen went out, so I have to go up here. There we go. Uh, traditional learning often creates bottlenecks in the dissemination of knowledge. You usually have like one instructor or one person in a lecture hall, um, but in a LARP, the students can be teaching other students. You have multiple points of uh, uh, information dissemination, so you can learn from other students based on their activity. Um, also, the fourth reason is power. Uh, it empowers the student. Uh, you can make decisions and live with them. So obviously, the trial is a great example. Um, but empowerment leads to another aspect of game-based learning in EduLARPs, which is the allowance of failure. I know I've heard a lot of people talking about this or lecture about this, but again, in EduLARPs, you're allowed to failure because you have a mask of alibi. So you're playing a character, and your character can fail, but you yourself are not. You have a chance of experience stuff. So you also get immediate feedback, and you get a chance to do it again. Uh, in terms of assessments, I just want to talk very briefly about this. It's easy to require. You can get written and oral reports from the students. Um, in the uh, Mesopotamia, one of the cities were actually time travelers, so at the end they were doing a time travel research paper that they needed to present. Um, all uh, EduLARPs can include a debrief period. It's very important for EduLARPs to have a debrief period. The students talk about what happened, what they learned. Um, besides creating artifacts, teachers can still use standardized testing, uh, knowing their students have applied the tested concept in a stressful context. So they're... Um, they, they've already kind of gone through it, and the, the idea is that we have a better chance of transfer of that knowledge. Um, so there's a couple of advantages, I think, that educational ARP has over digital educational games. This might be controversial, so uh, go with it. One is that they're very cheap. The materials cost for an EduLARP can range from zero to a few hundred dollars. The most expensive one I ran was $380, and 230 of that was for gift cards for the top players. Uh, this does not include development or design costs or the commercial cost of the game if there is one. So in schools that can't afford to supply classrooms with pen and paper, like this one from Donors Choose, she's looking, for, I need folders, pens, papers, laminating sheets. Um, an EduLARP is, is oftentimes more affordable than a series of computers, smartphones, Google Cardboard, etc. Easy. Uh, EduLARPs can be run without tablets, computers, Wi-Fi, or electricity. They don't need the latest patch or software update. They don't require teachers to know computer science nor tech support. Um, they just need a willing suspension of disbelief and a little imagination. This here is this, uh, another science one where the students play Dr. Frankenstein. They use different colors of Play-Doh to represent different elements to make their little uh, monsters. Uh, I did the same class where they learned mass density volume using trash bags and shredded paper. Also, EduLARPs are very fast. Uh, I, had, I worked with a development team of six. We created beta versions of eight uh, week-long science history LARPs in five weeks. So we did eight games in five weeks. Um, they all kind of followed a set model, but each one was different. We had a different board game, different invention, different culture, different characters. It was a very intense five weeks, but it was five weeks. And EduLARPs are very flexible. This one, I think, is, is, um, is really good for teachers. Um, because it's easily adjusted and scaled for different uh, learning abilities. So I, uh, my model is thinking of EduLARPs like Dungeons and Dragons or any role-playing game. The teacher is the game master, students are the players. So if, you, if you've done role-playing games, you know that the GM customizes the scenario to fit the players reacting to it. So a teacher running an EduLARP can alter their course without having to reprogram the app or the, or the game. So they change the income automatically uh, from something like that. So if a student wants to go explore something that's not programmed, that's not in the database, they can. Because I heard uh, from the teachers the next year, they ran ancient Mesopotamia the second year. This time, one of the students launched a coup and used his armies to take over from the judges of Babylon. <laughs> he took over. And they didn't know what to do. But then what happened is he and all his armies took over. They had to now govern. They now had to run it, and all the students came up, where's my, where's my grain, where's my income? And they started demanding all this stuff. So what an amazing lesson when the students take over and now you have to govern. It's easy to take over strategically, but what do you have to do? So the teachers went along with it. So, sorry, um, no matter how vastly versatile a digital game can be, I still 
personally don't think it can improvise an appropriate reaction to an overly ambitious and strategic sixth grader, <laughs> at least not yet. So, uh, so I'm, I'm interested in sticking with talented and trained human teachers and students engaged in face-to-face -face interactivity. So I now have just a little bit of time for any questions. Please raise your hand if you have a question. In the back there. Yeah, so one of the first ones I did was a science fiction one where the students were on a spaceship and they were actually using real like science spect spectro uh, spectrography, spectrography, um, the spectrograph and stuff like that, but the math and science, they had to do math prompts to make the spaceship go and raise the shields and things like that. Uh, you, can, you can apply basically anything into an edulark and I found that it's much easier to uh, match uh, different lessons instead of comp compartmentalize them. It's easier when I was doing the science starts to bring in math. It's very difficult for me to separate here's math and here's science. They come together. And even I did another one where the students played uh, scientists of history and the ancient um, uh, enlightenment. So they're getting the history of Lavoisier and Benjamin Franklin and all the scientists of old. They're role playing and learning the historical context as well as the scientific aspects of it. So yes, it definitely applies. Yeah, right there, right there. Yeah, you, uh-huh, in the, in the white, yeah. So the, right, so one of, one of the purposes that I'm trying to do is to um, what I call boxing, which is get a, a lesson plan that explains everything in it. One, if you're familiar with edu-LARPing, then you can skip ahead. Otherwise, here's what LARPing is, here's what you have to do. And I'm trying to get like the science ones in a position that any teacher can grab it, read it, and go, okay, we're ready to go. All the materials, things are all printed in there. So that's where the idea is, to get a package that you can get it and go. Yeah, right on the aisle there. Reacting to the past, yep. Very familiar with it. Yeah, Come, uh, talk to me uh, afterwards, but yes, Barnard College does reacting to the past, been doing it for a bunch of time. It's college level history and it's LARPing. So, literary history, yeah, it's wonderful. So one more question, I'm going over time. Oh, I have so many right there. It's, it's difficult because there's, um, they have to sort of get into it and then there's kind of the barrier that a lot of teachers fear of I won't be able to do this. What do you mean I have to act, I have to role play and stuff like that? So uh, that's one of the things I'm interested in doing and if people want to talk about it, I would love to talk to you about distributing it. I have some ideas of trying to get a community hub source where you can get these things and teachers can talk to designers, designers can talk to teachers, and you can go back and forth and have a conversation between what teachers want and need and what designers can make with the teachers. So they can definitely uh, do that. So thank you very much. By the way, Darren Zanuck is alive. So if you read your stuff, if you read your thing, that wraps up the educational LARP you've all been playing. So all I did with this handout was create a simple story that goes over this otherwise dull PowerPoint presentation. So imagine how much more fun and engaging this would a traditional lecture be if students had a role to play in the fiction instead of just being a student at a thing. That's all edu-LARPs need to be. Your secret, you were secret, read your thing, keep it. You were secret agents and you had to watch the PowerPoint and listen to me and follow the story. That's all I did is put a little story over this. Um, so that's basically it. That's all it needs to be. If you want to contact me with more questions, um, I've read AaronVanek.com or AaronLarp at gmail.com. I'll be around. Come talk to me. And I don't know if we have lunch right now. Not yet. Thank you so okay, much. Okay. Thank you, guys.